Um, I just wanted to start y'all off with a little music this morning with some harmonica, hopefully uh, something to nourish your souls. Um, and oh, my name is Miguel Santiago, for those who don't know. And uh, I hope you enjoy. Uh, this first song is a little bit of a medley. Uh, St. James Infirmary, classic blues standard, and a song called A Living Man by this French composer. A song about life and death, but my goal is to start with the song about death and bring us back to life. So, good morning and join me for this little ride. Living Man, St. James and Fermi Blues. Hope y'all enjoyed. Uh, I wanna dedicate that song uh, to Elijah McClain and his family and his community. Uh, there are not enough tears and condolences to express how much I'm hurt by that loss. I can only hope that what I played will make it into the hearts of that community and give you whatever comfort you need. This next song is meant to definitely lift the spirit. It's kind of my variation, a little play on a classic spiritual, swing low, sweet chariot. Um, so we're about to, about to take it to another level, about to take you to that place. Uh, let's have some fun with it.
And the last song I want to leave you with is very fitting for the times we're in right now. Um, it is the summertime, and we must not forget that. This is a time where the sun shines upon our skin. It is where we get that energy. For those with that melanin, it is, it is our, it's our nourishment. It is the time for us to recharge and be re-energized, and it's time for us to, to just bask in that sun. I grew up in the South. I grew up in Stone Mountain. I love the summer. I love seeing the magnolias bloom. As kids, that's where you go to hide. That's where you go to get the shade. And when you're in those trees, that's the song that I'm hearing. That was the song that I used to hear growing up. And I want to make sure and leave y'all with this last song. So Summertime, originally composed by George Gershwin, covered by many. My favorite cover was by Nina Simone. And I'm about to give y'all my little variation of it. But I hope you enjoyed. Thank you. Thank y'all for giving me the time and the space. And again, my name is Miguel Santiago. And real quick, I just want to make uh, just a quick announcement. Um, you'll see in the comments, I believe there'll be some links on how to contact me. But there's a link for a petition that I've started. And it means a lot to me. As I mentioned, I'm from Stone Mountain, Georgia. And uh, that is known for a lot of things. But it's known for this Confederate monument in which I've started a petition to hopefully take down. And I don't know if it'll ever happen. I don't know what will ever come of it, but I know I have to try. And I can use all the support in the world, so that would mean so much to me. Uh, but thank you. Yo. Thank you, Miguel Santiago. Don't y'all need a morning that starts off with some blues? Yes. Thank you, Miguel, so much for sharing not only your gift, but sharing your advocacy with us. Uh, if you want to know a little bit more about Miguel, I want to give you a few facts, some important facts to know about Miguel. First of all, I want you to know he's a recent graduate of Harvard's Graduate School for Education, where he studied educational policy, and he recently served as the regional director for the American Voices Project out of Stanford University's Center on Poverty and Inequality. So that brother... That brother does some good work, along with playing the harmonica. If you want to follow Miguel, you can follow him at another underscore brother 87. And I do want to bring attention to the advocacy he is doing to remove the Confederate statues from Stone Mountain. If you are interested in signing this petition, you want to go to change.org slash take Stone Mountain 
down. Yes. And good morning, Creative Mornings people. My name is Amina Brown, and I am one of your co-hosts, so I'm excited to be here this weekend. Blake is on vacation, so he left me here with y'all, and I'm happy to see y'all. So I hope y'all are doing well, taking care of yourselves this morning. We have a great event, so I hope you're in your PJs or whatever your comfy clothes are, and I hope you got your coffee. But if you didn't, let me give a shout out to a few places that you can do this with y'all. And I've been talking to y'all and I'll be forgetting all about the slides. This right here is the information about Miguel. You can follow him yourself. Look at that. It's amazing. You can do that right now. Also, listen, treat yourself to coffee. And look, all three of our coffee places this month are black owned coffee shops. Also, let me tell you something else. You can not only get free coffee, you can also get a free pastry if you tell them Creative Morning sent you before 12 p.m. And I wanna push you a little further. I wanna tell you, if you don't get there before 12 and you don't get your free coffee and your free pastry, I wanna tell you take your dollars over to these black owned coffee shops and just support them anytime. Support our black owned businesses in Atlanta. It's important, all right? Now, let me tell you, we got three locations here. We got Hodgepodge, Urban Grind, and Blend Cafe. And I think we are hodgepodge at the main location, but I see a note here. I'm gonna say go to the main location, the original big old hodgepodge, but anytime go to all these locations, take your money there. You will not regret that. All right, we wanna thank our Creative Mornings ATL team. Also, we have to say goodbye to one of our team members, Molly Massey, who has been a producer for Creative Mornings Atlanta for a long time. Molly is leaving us, but she is going on to do and continue to do awesome, awesome things. So Molly, thank you for all of the time that you've helped make Creative Mornings what it is. So I want y'all to put some applause emojis in the chat for Molly. All right, let's talk about some of the other people that make creative mornings happen. Let's see what else we got. Okay, first of all, we want to give a very special shout out to Friendly Human. That's where we are here today filming from the Friendly Human Studios. I feel so fancy. I wish y'all could see this clicker. It's so fancy. Like, look, it's so sleek. I mean, everything's great. Also, we want to tell you about a new platform that Friendly Human has called VidLoft. VidLoft is a combination of your DIY and you being able to get a professional touch on the content that you make, right? So say if you have this great idea for this quarantine music video you always wanted to make, you could shoot it yourself, VidLoft can help you, you can shoot it yourself, and then you can send in the footage and get professional touch on your music video. And I know all of y'all got a little song in your heart. You got a song in your heart, you've been trying to make a video, let VidLoft and Friendly Human help you. I want you to visit vidloft.com, check all those things on the website, it's great. Also, we wanna give a special shout out to Jenny Wentling, and Jenny designed this set that you see behind me. And Jenny, we wanna thank you for making this beautiful set behind us. This set is a shout out to Pride Month, so I wanna say happy Pride Month to everyone in the LGBTQ community. And Jenny, I wanna thank you for this fist over here. I'm sorry, wrong arm. This fist over here, <laughs> because this is also a shout out to Black Lives Matter. And the great thing about Black Lives Matter and Pride Month is these are things we can celebrate every day, all day. We want to do that, right? So thank you so much, Jenny. Also, we want to thank another one of our partners, Matchstick. Matchstick is a branding firm located in Grant Park. So if you need help with your business, clarifying your message, standing out in the market, Matchstick is the place you want to go and find out how to get your messaging together, all right? Also, we wanna thank MailChimp. MailChimp is our local and an official global partner for Creative Mornings. So we are so, so thankful for them. They are our marketing automation partner. Also, MailChimp's always cooking up some cool stuff. And one of the newest things that they've put out is a bi-monthly magazine called Courier Media. So you wanna sign up for that at couriermedia.co slash sign up. This is a place where you can get stories, insights, things that can help you work better, live smarter and be happier. Who doesn't wanna do that? All right, oh, mm -hmm, yep. <laughs> y'all, I enjoy talking to y'all so bad that I'll be like, what's a slide? So here, now you can see all of this. This is so great. And Courier Media is just one of the things that MailChimp has that you definitely want to check out, yeah. All right, we want you to make sure you're posting on your socials using our hashtag, our local hashtag, 
is Atlanta underscore CM. Our global hashtag this month is hashtag CM Insecure. And if you want to follow Atlanta's Creative Mornings, you want to go to Atlanta underscore CM. Yeah. Also, speaking of our socials, we want to thank our partners at C Spark Go. If you need help with your socials, you need help with marketing or PR, these are the people you want to talk to about that. We thank them so much and we appreciate their partnership as well. And here we are. Our theme this month is insecure. And I don't know how many of you are first timers. If you are a first timer to Creative Mornings Atlanta, I want you to put your one finger emoji, this finger, not the other one finger. <laughs> put this finger emoji in the chat and let us know. If this is your first time, you are a part of an event that is happening locally here, but it's also happening globally in different cities all over the world this month. And we are all covering the theme Insecure. And we are not just talking about the HBO show Insecure. Issa Rae is not going to be here today. But we are talking about Insecure and all the different ways we can approach that word. We could be talking about uh, what it means for us as people that are doing creative of an entrepreneurial work, uh, how we feel the emotions of feeling insecure as we think about creating new things, finding new ways, uh, new approaches to things, maybe ending one thing and beginning another, right? We have all sorts of things like that that we have to think about. And when we think about insecure, we can also think about uh, how are our communities doing? Are our communities um, having food insecurity? Are our communities experiencing other insecurities that make it hard for people in our communities to live uh, full lives, to live the lives that they would like to live? Yeah. So I'm really excited for us to explore that theme. And I'm really excited to bring up a poet to help us further explore the theme insecure. And I'm doubly excited because she is my friend. So I'm excited to introduce you all to Joan Lyric Leslie. Uh, Joan is a Harlem, New York native. So I have known her all these years by her stage name, which is Harlem's own Lyric. Lyric is a performance poet, community organizer, and podcast host. Lyric has been a member of two National Poetry Slam teams. Her work has been featured on Button Poetry, Right About Now, All Deaf Poetry, Voyage, ATL Magazine. She is a Southern Fried Poetry Slam finalist, two-time Queen of the South Poetry Slam champion. I want you to show all your applause emoji love to Harlem's own Lyric. Good morning, Creative Mornings. How y'all doing? Uh, I'm, I'm gonna just imagine that y'all are telling me you're doing well, the kids are driving you crazy at home, but you're appreciating the sunshine that Atlanta is giving to us today. Uh, but we can't wait to have you back in person with us. We're just being safe for today. I wanna just refer back to Amina's uh, reference to the topic today. Today's uh, today we're going to be focusing on insecurities and it made me think about two poems that I always go to to help me heal and get back to that confidence level that, that I need and I think that's the responsibility of artists. When we have gone through a process or a phase, it's our duty to show other people, give other people the words so that they can get through it when the time comes for them. So this is a short poem, it's a short affirmation that I recite to myself on those insecure days. When I tell my body it is loved, but remove myself from the narrative, it's not quite sure who we are trying to convince. My body asks, Joan, why be a trophy when you can be a mountain? Memorialize the magic, show the babies how it's done. How once the baby fat grows into glory, it's both misfortune and a miracle, both menacing and medicinal, but who wouldn't want to capture all this cure? It's a redemption song, an altar call and the baptism, how it swallows the unholy, hopes they don't notice the tears and toxins in the water, this body still prays to be holy water in hopes that this will make it whole, asks, that you put some respect on its name. Call it by its proper pronoun, I, because when you talk about a thing like it don't belong to you, it appears to be up for the taking, easily shaken, replaceable, and removed. But Joan, aren't you a mountain? And don't it take one hell of a force to make a mountain move? 
So uh, I'm going to be honest with y'all, Creative Mornings, because y'all not really here to, to look me in the face and, and, and be able to tell when, when I'm fronting and when I'm not. Uh, some days I don't wake up and feel like a mountain, right? So if, if that's you and you can relate, uh, you don't have the secure days every morning. Uh, I think it, it's important to refer to other people in our lives who affirm us. So one person whose words I've always been able to go to when my own words cannot soothe me uh, is my grandfather. And he's no longer here with us, but this is a short poem I wrote for him. It's 1998. My parents buy me a pink four-wheeler that I ride up and down the hallway. My granddad asks if I'm ever going to take it outside the house. You know where it should be written, by now I am eight. I ride the bike whenever and wherever I choose to ride the bike. It's 2015. My granddad calls to wish me a happy birthday. He asks how I plan to celebrate. I say, with a car. It's a two door, it's white with a gold trim along the side. He says, nice, but who is it for? As if to ask, how does a woman of my stature plan to find comfort in such a toy? It's 2020, and my granddad is no longer here to wish me a happy birthday, but now I get it. He wanted to know why I kept trying to fit this body into places it don't belong, into men who had hallways for hearts that kept leading them all to me. My granddad looked at me and saw the freeway a future bright enough to resurrect dreams from the ancestors, didn't quite consider himself an ancestor, asked for at least another decade so he'd be around to keep me in drive to remind me. The women I am made of have always been too big for the lives they've chosen, their hearts swollen from doing twice the work and calling it love. My granddad looked at me and saw a mountain trying to fit inside of a molehill, but he's always been a mirror, a megaphone and reminder that this body will always be too big for the box I tried to hide the magic in. He's always wanted to see the show. He had already seen the bodies I had starved my own to feed. He wanted to know how he kept putting food on the table. Yet I chose to be all but full. His dying wish was to see me embrace this body as too big for the life I've tried to squeeze it inside of. A dying wish I finally decided he deserved. Thank you, Creative Mornings. You are in for a show. Y'all give it up one time. Give it up. Put your applause emoji in the chat, with whichever side it is. Put applause emoji in there for Harlem's own lyric. Harlem's own lyric is going to be putting out a book this fall, so you want to stay up on that. You want to follow her on socials and go to her website. Also. If you are a poetry fan, Harlem's Own Lyric is the host of the Fifth Thursday Open Mic at Urban Grind Coffee, which is one of our coffee partners today. So you can go to at Urban Grind ATL and on July 30th, you can experience Open Mic from your IG. I mean, get into that. So thank you, Harlem's Own Lyric. I told you, she's dope. All right. We also want to thank uh, another one of our global partners, WordPress.com. Shout out to all of you that know how to use WordPress. I thank you for your service. As well as WordPress has a new series for you to get involved in. It's actually a partnership between WordPress and Creative Mornings, okay? So it's called Own Your Content. And how many of us who are doing creative work know that it is very important to know what it means to honor your work by owning your own content. So definitely check this out on the WordPress platform. That's a jam. We also wanna thank another one of our partners. This is our official project management partner, Basecamp. Here's what you need to know. Basecamp has a new service that they are coming out with called Hey. I like that. It's a new email service. It's um, like, what you might like about Gmail, but more delightful. And who doesn't want to make their email more delightful? So this thing requires you to go in there and sign up. Okay, so you can email I want at hey.com or you can just visit hey.com or maybe you could say hey at your home and like a thing will pop up. You just don't know what's going to happen. So make sure you check out hey.com to get all the information on that. 
next month, July. Our theme is underdog and our speaker is hip hop artist and producer Andy Minio. You don't want to miss that. Andy Minio has 1.7 million Spotify listeners. He's had billboard charting records and sold out tours across the U.S. and Europe. So you definitely want to be a part of that next month. One more thing I got to tell you about Andy real quick. You can also listen to, there's an interview that Blake did with him on Blake's podcast, Creative Rising, and he's talking to Andy about embracing restraint. So definitely make sure you check that out. You'll be all prepared for next month. Now, we are excited to talk about our speaker today. We are really happy to welcome, uh, he is known colloquially among a lot of us here in Atlanta as John O, but names are important and I want to pronounce his full name because we want to pronounce everyone's full names because names matter, right? So we know him as John O, but his full name is John Owuchekwa. Oh, I love that name. It's amazing. So listen, these are the things you need to know about John Owuchekwa. He is husband to Chandra and father to Ava. Moved here to Atlanta in 2009 to help restore communities here in Atlanta. Also, most recently, is an entrepreneur attempting to pour a new narrative alongside Portrait Coffee, as well as being a pastor and an author. We want to welcome to our Creative Mornings Atlanta stage our speaker today, John O. All right, am I on? Excellent. All right, we're going to make this little COVID safe handoff. I'm happy to be here with y'all. It's an honor to share this stage. And before we start, uh, one thing I do just want to bring to your attention um, out there is that it's been 105 days since uh, Breonna Taylor was killed and the men that killed her are still free. It's sobering. And that's part of the reason why we do what we do. So I'm just going to bring you into a little bit of what we're trying to do with Portrait Coffee, and we're trying just to pour a new narrative. I don't know if I need to click it right now. Uh, Y'all can just embrace the awkwardness that comes with us trying to do this um, and act like you're here, but you're not really here. Here's what we're trying to do. We're trying to pour a new narrative in coffee. Um, for all the type A's out there that already have your notes app up and you're trying to uh, take notes, I'm just gonna give you my two points up front, and the two points that I have is this. Um, insecurity is always a thief. It's always a thief. And um, geography is never an accident. That one's going to come later. So uh, just a little bit of, uh, about me. Um, I didn't like coffee nine years ago. So I got into it um, reluctantly. So I tend to live my life by a set of rules that I find out when people want to extend hospitality to me. Uh, if I just have these arbitrary rules of what I do or don't do, um, I don't come off as rude when I reject it. I come off as principled. So in my 20s, I came up with just a list of arbitrary rules and there are things like this. They would say, John, why don't you smoke? And just the rule that I came up was, um, I don't enjoy things on fire that close to my face. Um, folks would say things like, John, do you want salad. And I said, well, I don't eat salad because it, it tastes like outside. That was a rule that I had. They'd say, John, why don't you like the outside? And my rule was, um, I like the outside, but I think the best use of outside is, is on its way to inside, right? And so uh, when folks would say, hey, John, do you want a cup of coffee? The rule that I created for myself was, um, I don't think beverages should be warm, right? Warm liquid already has a name. It's either bath water or soup, and I don't find either particularly appetizing, right? Well, all of that changed for me when, as a 27-year-old pastor, um, I just found myself working these early mornings and late nights, and I got to a place where I had to have something to keep me up. All we had in the uh, house were these little Folgers instant crystals that uh, my mom and my dad left, so my wife made it for me, and I tasted it and I said, it's not that bad. So then what I, did, what I did was what I do with everything that I get involved in. I really started to just nerd out on it and just try to explore uh, what it was like. And so in 2012, I got a chance to start traveling the 
country to speak. Twitter was just starting to pop off then. So whenever I would land in a place, I would tweet and ask folks, where are the best coffee shops? And all over the country, um, I would walk into these shops and I started to notice a coincidence. Um, my introduction to coffee was filled with insecurity. Every time, just as a black man in the US, I found myself walking into the front door of an interest. Insecurity was there to greet me, telling me that I didn't belong. So I walked into a coffee shop, um, and this is what I saw, right? These are the dudes. You know him, the, you know, the bearded white dude with an ax, um, you know, the two tight pants on, rolled up. You see the little boots. Um, I wore a flannel today to show my solidarity with the coffee community, but I'm married, right? So there's no way that my wife would let me leave the crib showing that much cleavage. Um, but I would see these guys and I would feel like I don't belong. So I spent my time trying to research and search, just trying to look for somebody uh, that looked like me that was involved in this thing. And I had to dig and dig and dig and then when I found out how coffee started, my mind was blown. I know there's some of y'all in here that may know this story, but if you don't, humor me. This is what my introduction to coffee should have been. Over a thousand years ago, uh, coffee was discovered in Africa. An Ethiopian goat herder named Kaldi was with his goats, and he saw that when his goats would eat these cherries, the goats would be turned, just lit, and, and he said, what is this? So we pulled it out, found out that I can take the bean, roast it, grind it, pour water on it, and create coffee, and he discovered it, right? Not a, not a Christopher Columbus discovery where I find somebody's paper and put my name on it. This was an actual one, so I spent my time trying to find somebody that looked like me that was involved in coffee, and I was blown away when I found out, no, no, wait, 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 it's not just people that look like me that were, are involved, the inventor of it was from the same continent that my parents were grown up in, and that completely changed my perspective. Insecurity had me ready to give up on an interest because I felt like I didn't belong. But then the more and more that I dug and found folks uh, that looked like me started it, I felt like, yo, I've got to carry this on, right? And the reason why I say that is because it's crazy, right? I was frustrated that I had to dig and I had to do all of this hard work to find somebody that looked like me. The inventor of coffee had no clue that a thousand years later, it would be the second most consumed beverage globally, right? Water, coffee, Coca-Cola. But he had no clue that even though it reached this far, his face would be all but forgotten, even though the pigment of the drink mirrored his own. So that set us on a spot where we're like, yo, other people have to know this story. Insecurity is a thief. It'll have you convincing or it will convince you that forfeit is better than failure. And once we saw this, once we saw this portrait, uh, things changed for us. Point one, insecurity is always a thief. Point two, um, geography is never an accident. Geography is never an accident. Uh, 11 years ago, I moved to Atlanta um, as a 25 year old to start a church with a group of folks here in uh, downtown. And so when I moved here in an attempt to learn the city of Atlanta, here's what I did. I parked my 99 Ford Explorer and I decided to ride MARTA all across the city. And so what I found out was that um, it's interesting how much you notice about a journey when you don't really care about the destination. So I would start at the southmost point, the airport station, and I would ride it all the way up north, and here's what I found. Um, as I would ride from south to north, I saw two things change. Here are the two things that changed. The inside of the train changed, and the outside of the train changed. The further that you go north, and you move through West End, 
uh, downtown, up through Buckhead and North Springs, what you'll find is that the inside of the train changes. Black and brown people exit and white folks get on. But then what you'll see is it's not just the inside of the train that starts to change, the outside of the train changes. The further that you go up north, the more and more the economic conditions improve. And not just improve, but skyrocket. So here's what takes place. In Atlanta, as you ride MARTA, you literally see black and brown people making their exit before they can take advantage of or enjoy the economic opportunities that surrounded them. And that may just seem like a coincidence, but then the more that I started to learn about coffee, here's what I found out. If you take the steps in the coffee supply chain and overlay it with the MARTA stops, you find the exact same thing that takes place. If the southernmost point or the black and brown farmers that own the land, right, Coffee literally grows where black and brown people grow. So you take that and replace it with the people that own the land that meticulously spend 10 to 12 hours per day planting, sowing, harvesting, reaping. And if the topmost part of the chain is the $18 bag that you buy in the store, what you find out is that as that train moves north, Black and brown people get off as the economic conditions improve. And what we came to the conclusion was um, that is not an accident. That is not a coincidence. It is an issue of injustice, not just globally, but in the city of Atlanta. And if you need more proof, right, here's why we do what we do. Um, Geography is never an accident. Here's two more maps about the city that we live in. The map on the left is 1930s. It's a redlining map. It was a process that the people that lived here in Atlanta intentionally did to keep black and brown people disadvantaged and advantage people that look like them. So they would outline or they would line predominantly black communities in red, and what they would do is they wouldn't give loans to those communities to be able to buy homes. So they wouldn't loan money to, but what they would do is they would build highways right through them. So I live in the West End, I have for the past six years, and I live less than a mile from Clark, Morehouse, and Spelman, and it is not a straight shot for me. I-20 split a neighborhood in half. So you look at that, that was intentionally constructed in 1930, and the map that you see on the right is the last census data. And what you see is that the racial breakdown in Atlanta mirrors the intention that the folks had back then. The people that created that plan for red lining are dead and gone, but their plan has successfully worked. Geography is never, it has never been an accident. And so all that we're trying to do is to paint a new picture. I mean, the stories, we could go on and on and on about the way that things take place. You, you can think of a town like Portland, Oregon, which if any of you know coffee, that feels like the coffee mecca. And there's a reason why you'll find a bunch of the first picture, the bearded, axe-wielding, uh, too tight pant, cuffed uh, jeans, boot wearing. There's a reason why that's the picture that you think of when you think of coffee. Geography is never an accident. Here's a little history lesson on Oregon. Oregon was in the north in the fight for the Union and the, cons the Confederacy, Oregon said, we want to be on the side that doesn't have slaves. So in 1859, Oregon joined the Union in the fight against slavery, but written in their constitution, 
which was not undone until 1922, was a clause that said, we don't think black folks should be slaves. However, it is illegal for black people to own property in Oregon. Geography is never an accident, and it has implications. So seeing all of this, one of the ways that we've thought about addressing insecurity is what we're trying to do is to say, um, insecurity is always a thief, but insecurity can be and has to be evicted. And the way that you evict insecurity is not by prescribing behaviors, it's by changing pictures. Nobody's behavior will ever rise above the vision that they have. And so at Portrait, we're trying to pour a new narrative. We're trying to change the picture that comes to mind when people think of specialty coffee. A picture is worth a thousand words and thousands of words have been painted that have unfortunately painted a picture of history that's cropped out folks that look like me and all that we're trying to do is to insert ourselves back in there so that the little black and brown boys and girls that are at Brown Middle School, half a mile from my house, that they can look and have a picture of what can be, that they don't have to look at an industry that was created by people that look like them and feel insecure that they don't have a place in it. Rather, we hope that they'll stand on our shoulders and successfully work back down that supply chain to ensure fair and equal treatment for all. That's the picture that we're trying to paint. Insecurity is conquered the same way that a mountain is conquered. You don't conquer a mountain by tearing it down, you can't do that. You conquer a mountain by climbing it and planting your flag on top of it so that people that are on the ground can look up, see a flag there, and say somebody's done it before, it can be done. That's what we're trying to do, and we hope that you'll uh, join us and continue to root us on in that journey. Thanks for your time. Y'all, give it up one time. All your applause emojis in the chat for our speaker today, John O. It's only me here to applaud, but <laughs> I'm giving y'all the sounds for that. We are so honored to have John O sharing his story with us, reminding us of the history in our city, uh, reminding us of what it can look like to change the narrative, to pour a new narrative. I love it. We want to take your questions for John O right now. So I'm going to get my phone real quick because Malik is getting ready to be texting me so we can get some questions for John. In the meantime, John, let me start with a question yeah. while we're waiting on people in our chat to uh, think of something to ask you. Now that coffee has become this such a popular drink, and we all sort of get in a routine, right, of yeah. the type of coffee shop we're used to going to. Right. But now when we think about justice, we can change some of the ways we're used to doing things. Yeah. As you are going on this path of entrepreneurship and returning to the true narrative of coffee, yeah. what would you say are suggestions people can do to be more just yeah. in the ways that we're thinking about that and what we do with our money? Yeah, yeah. So one is, um, Know your product, right? Know what people are doing. All right, here's what takes place in the coffee supply chain. People that actually own the land, right? And just so we have a framework, the economic impact of coffee in the US for a year, yeah, I don't know, all right, I need to look here. Um, for a year is $225 billion. So a quarter of a trillion dollars, that's the impact coffee has on the USA. So to put that into perspective, that is what the NBA does 28 times over. And the people that literally own this land are getting paid pennies. Mm. The first opportunity that they have uh, to be able to make any income comes from being able to own the washing station so that they can export. Um, and they don't own those, right? 
because they don't get paid enough to own those. And so there are groups out there like um, Red Bay Coffee out in Oakland. It's done an amazing job of being able to go to places, pay people fair wages. St. Frank's, right? There's lots of folks that have done that. So the first thing that I would say is educate yourself. Know your product. There are people that are making a killing um, off of the backs of folks. So know your product. Do your research. And one of the things that you can do um, is right buy black. And I'm going to say that unapologetically. Uh, so it's not just that black folks should continue to help folks buy black, but it really needs to be uh, a collective effort with people that have a conscience, n realizing that um, the disparities that we see in our world today didn't get to be the way that they are on accident, right? The government through redlining created a white middle class. It was not a middle class before that took place. And so every group is supposed to rely on their government to be able to help them advance. And um, historically, black and brown folks have not been able to have that reliance. So they need the support of conscious, conscious minded Americans that yeah, want to see justice. And it can be as easy as changing your coffee provider. Great answer. OK, other questions from our audience. Uh, someone is asking, Atlanta is currently experiencing gentrification, including in the neighborhood that Portrait is in. What can we do to actively fight this? Yeah. Um, those are the things that we've been trying to work through for years, right? One of the things that we find out is um, things like NPU meetings, where decisions are made. What we often find is there's a large absence of people that have these con con concerns. So we see a lot of people with concerns in turn, or, or they express their concerns on uh, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and personal relationships that they have uh, with folks. But one of the things that we don't often see is that translate into tangible action on the neighborhood planning level where decisions are made on who gets to come in and who gets to go out. Uh, people informed not just on their vote, right? So we don't just want to vote party line. We want to vote in such a way where people are aware of the track record of the people that they vote for. Um, and it's a complex thing, but it's a, that's a thing that, man, if I had an answer to that, I'd write a book and I would make lots of money. So in the absence of that, we've chosen as a group of folks to just yeah, try our best to live in the communities that we're trying to change um, and serve on a very grassroots level. So that's something that we're still trying to work through. Yeah, our next question's coming from Alex. Alex wants to know, where do you all source your beans from and how did those relationships develop? Yeah, so right now we source our beans from an importer, right? So. Um, the tough thing is, is that um, when you're first starting out in coffee, in order to have a direct relationship with farmers out there, you've got to understand people are selling in tons, right? So they're selling in miles. And us as an upstart, we're buying in inches. So we don't have a bunch of power. So right now we're trying to build relationships with a good importers that we know. Um, we're grateful because we've gotten uh, lots of connections with people that have been in the industry for some time and they're starting to allow us to ride their coattails. And so right now we're just trying to be as responsible as we can with the influence that we have and trusting that as our influence grows, we're going to try to carry the same integrity uh, with us. Molly wants to know, how will you create your storefront to speak to the black community? How will it look different from all the whitewashed coffee shops in Atlanta? Yeah, um, I'm gonna give a little bit of homework for all the folks that are out here. Um, Eugene Robinson, I think back in 08, wrote a book, Disintegration, the Splintering of Black America. And one of the things that he brings up is that after the civil rights movement, um, there was, 
a bifurcation or a disintegration, right? Whereas prior to that, to be black in the US was all to be oppressed in the same way. Now what he brings up is that post this time, there's actually four different black Americas with all their concerns, right? You've got the transcendent elites, the Oprahs, the Jordans, the Tiger Woods, the Tyler Perrys. You've got the mainstream, right? So black and brown folks that tend to make as much as their white contemporaries. You've got migrants, folks like my mom and my dad that aren't from here but moved here. Um, and then you have folks that are mixed race, right? So they're black and white or black and something else. And what we find out is that uh, there's a wide spectrum of blackness. And so our aim is we want to be true to the entire spectrum. What we don't want to do is, um, yeah, I mean, so you're not going to walk in and see just afros and fists and kente cloths, right? Uh, but you're not, not going to see that. We're just trying to be true to the wide spectrum that is blackness and celebrate all of it. So it's the type of thing, uh, when you come in, you'll be able to feel the difference. Mm. Book Girl 1971 asks, what more can we do in the black community to make sure that our local businesses succeed? Yeah, frequent support. Um, one of the things that I would say is uh, even before the action, sometimes we can be too quick to just act and tell me what to do. Uh, but one of the things that you find out is that, you know, willingness to help without the wisdom of the best way to help, what that's going to do um, is it's going to lead to you saying something like this. But I was only trying to help. And the only time that anybody says that is after there's been a major fallout. So the first thing that I would say is um, if you're on here and uh, you may be white or you may have found yourselves in a place where I haven't experienced the effects of racism and I'm unfamiliar with all of that, then the very first thing that you can do, not the only thing, but the very first thing that you can do is learn. Learn that the problem is not just with um, income. The problem is with unfair treatment as it relates to uh, loans, building spaces. I mean, I think of our own story. There was one storefront that was in this place, Westview, and we had some dear friends in coffee. They looked at the space. Um, the landlord was providing them incentives, tenant improvement, all of this stuff. Um, they knew that we were getting ready to, to start this shop. And one of the things that they said was, hey, y'all are here. We think that this place is prime, but we really want to help and see y'all thrive. So we're politely going to bow out and we want you to have this space if y'all want it. Uh, well, we had the exact same conversation with the exact same landlord, and we didn't get the same warm welcome. So it's things like that that take place all of the time. And so if you have a platform, uh, the best use of your platform is to advocate for people that don't have one. So I would say learn, dig down deep, dive, and use your platform not just to support financially, but use your platform to advocate for people that don't have the same platform to advocate. Thank you, John. That's great. We got two more questions All for right. you. Becca says, your first introduction was instant coffee. What's your coffee ritual or your favorite way to drink it now? And Becca says, P.S., signing up for your club now. There we go. All right. <laughs> See, that's one way that y'all can su 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 uh, support. You know, a shameless plug is you can sign up now. Uh, my favorite way to drink now is on what's called a uh, Kalita wave. One of the things that we're trying to do now is uh, uh, there's a lot of people that tend to make coffee more complex than it is. Every morning I get up at four in the morning, grind my beans, pour it over a Kalita wave. I usually have a um, more of a darker roast, something with rich chocolatey notes in the AM, um, and then my afternoon cup is more bright, fruity, uh, Ethiopian, uh, something like that. So thanks, Becca. Uh, we appreciate you. I feel very fancy, John. I feel very fancy just hearing about the notes of the coffee. Oh, yeah. No, no, I got fancy. you, Amina. I got you. 
<laughs> our last question is coming from Sierra. Sierra asks, which, if any, of our local community leaders or city council persons do you think are doing a good job fighting systematic racism in Atlanta? Yeah. Um, so that is, is a hard question for me, and I don't want you to take my um, hesitancy to answer that question as an indictment on anybody more so than just ignorance um, in, uh, or as it relates to me. So um, I think I've been more aware on a grassroots level of uh, people that have done things. People like Justin Gibney with the AND campaign, uh, Mike Davis, and the group of folks that you'll hear about, City Roots ATL, that their whole aim is really trying to make Atlanta uh, cash that check that they wrote about affordable housing. So look up uh, the AND campaign, look up City Roots, ATL. Those are two grassroots groups that I think are doing a fantastic job. John O, thank you so much yeah. for being our speaker. Y'all put all, I want you to do two things. I want you to put your applause emoji in the chat, but I want you to take your dollars and applaud with them to support Portrait Coffee, to support uh, the Black-owned coffee shops and just Black-owned businesses in general. Uh, thank you so much, John O, for pouring a new narrative for us this morning. I hope you all have a fantastic rest of the day today, and we'll see y'all next month for our theme, Underdog. Have a great day, y'all. Excellent. Thank you.